Hello everyone. Thank you for coming to my honors presentation. As you can probably tell from the title somewhere, today we're talking about Cicero. You may or may not know a whole lot about Cicero, but I find odds are you probably have heard the name, even if it's from the cell block tango in the musical Chicago. Well, the musical is referring to a hotel, which would have been named after the Cicero we're talking about today, who was a famous orator in the golden age of Rome. But Cicero wasn't just an orator. Scholars take interest in Cicero the orator, yes, but also Cicero the philosopher, Cicero the political activist, Cicero the grieving father or the exile. But all of these different Ciceros give the impression of a larger than life character or even a multitude of Ciceros, but he was just one man. So in my research, I wanted to meet Cicero. And it became clear to me that I would have to find a way to see how all of these identities of Cicero converged into one man. I took as my case study Cicero's Tusculan Disputations. This work is comprised of five books, each containing a preface from Cicero and then a fictitious discussion at his Tusculan villa between two interlocutors denoted merely as A and M. And if you're wondering, Cicero is supposed to be M. Each disputation addresses a question or an issue regarding the soul and disorders of the soul, and they kind of build on each other. So book one is about death as an evil, book two is about pain as an evil, book three talks about distress as the greatest disorder of the soul, and book four discusses the other disorders of the soul. But book five really is the climax, wherein the question is asked whether virtue is sufficient to live a happy life. And the disputations were written toward the end of Cicero's own life in 45 BCE, just after Cicero returned from exile and during a time of his retirement, wherein he was writing a great deal on philosophical topics. Additionally, Cicero had just suffered a great personal misfortune as his daughter Tullia had died as a result of childbirth earlier that very same year. I detail in my essay the scholarship surrounding the disputations, noting that for the most part there are two disjointed approaches. Many scholars have brilliantly illustrated how Cicero's approach to philosophy and oratory impact the disputations. Other scholars focus entirely on Cicero's personal tragedy and how it factors into his writing. Considering how well these scholars had shown how both sides were integral to Cicero's final product, I figured it should be possible to see how both sides of Cicero factor into the disputations at the same time, because scholars were speaking about the same Cicero in the same work. But before we dive into a few passages where I found this, let me fill you in on what the two bodies of scholarship were talking about. On the one hand, we have scholars who focus on Cicero's remarkable blend of rhetoric and philosophy. It was remarkable because the two were mutually almost suspicious of each other. That is, many Roman orators were suspicious of philosophy, and many philosophers were suspicious of rhetoric. Sorry. Oratory was a well-respected and thoroughly developed art in Rome, and Cicero was a part of that culture. He'd studied rhetoric since a young age, knew all the common conventions of rhetoric, and also knew how to break them well. He'd also studied philosophy from a young age, and he'd had several reputable tutors and was enthusiastic about the subject. But that part of his education had to be put to the wayside during Cicero's working years. It was thought that philosophy would interfere with the proper public life of a Roman aristocrat. But Cicero had been advocating for philosophy and oratory for at least a decade before the disputations. In 55 BCE, Cicero released De Oratore, On the Orator, 
Unlike typical rule books about oratory, De Oratore was about the person of the orator and how the ideal orator should approach their craft. After all, each case is different and the rules don't suit every occasion. So the ideal orator must have a more expansive repertoire than merely a knowledge of rhetorical rules. Among the qualities of an ideal orator, according to Cicero, is universal knowledge, especially philosophy. This conviction is what led Cicero to write philosophy in well-constructed Latin. He says in the preface of Book I of the Disputations that, quote, it was incumbent on me to throw light upon that study by a work in the Latin tongue. So while Cicero was not the first Roman to write philosophy, he was kind of the first to do it well, because he saw his work of philosophy also as a work of oratory, which played to his strengths and would be better received by a Roman audience. Not only did Cicero aspire to convince Rome that philosophy was valuable, he also had to advocate for the presence of sophisticated rhetoric in his philosophy, because many philosophers in the manner of Socrates and Plato viewed rhetoric as kind of a deceitful imitator of philosophy, because a rhetor can sound as though they know the truth while remaining entirely ignorant. At least that's the very basis of their critique. However, Cicero had not been the only philosopher orator since the time of Plato. Indeed, Cicero declares that he will indulge his philosophy with eloquence, quote, just as Aristotle, under the stimulus of the fame of the rhetorician Isocrates. So Cicero aligns himself with these famous Greek philosopher orators, especially Aristotle, without hesitation, even to legitimize his project just as he had used his prestige as an orator to put the Roman public at ease. So the mending of the divergence between Roman oratory and philosophy had to be made in both directions. So in the disputations, when we notice philosophy and rhetoric being used simultaneously, we can note that this was a countercultural act on the part of Cicero. And one can see how that alone has fascinated scholars and become the entire focus of their work. But setting aside a brilliant and innovative scholar, there's also a very broken man to be seen in these pages. As I mentioned before, Cicero's daughter Tullia had died early in the year that Cicero wrote the Disputations. In letters to his friend Atticus, we can see how dearly Cicero loved his daughter. He often refers to her as darling little Tullia, and he calls her a matchless daughter. He says such things as, I only wish I could run straight to the embraces of my Tullia. And my dear Tullia's illness and weakness frightens me to death. In light of this affection, it's difficult to overstate Cicero's reaction to her death. His grief was obsessive, nigh pathological. He becomes determined to build a shrine for Tullia and to, quote, consecrate her memory by every kind of memorial borrowed from the genius of all the masters, Greek and Latin. Perhaps it will only gall my wound, but I consider myself pledged. So not only was Cicero's grief acute, but Cicero began to be criticized for how extended his grieving period was. To this he responds, quote, For my part, I don't see what people are complaining of or what they expect of me. Not to grieve? How is that possible? Not to be prostrated? No one was ever less prostrated. Those cheerful friends of yours who blame me cannot read as much as I have written. So Cicero responds both with indignance that such grieving should be unacceptable and denial that he's really grieving all that much. After all, he's writing, which involves no small presence of mind. And what Cicero was writing at the time was the Tusculan Disputations, a work focused upon pain and happiness, a work that would have hit Cicero close to home.
So scholars have devoted considerable time and energy to illuminate how, on the one hand, Cicero's remarkable approach to philosophy and rhetoric is used in the disputations, and how, on the other, Cicero's personal grief was imbued in the work. As expected, my own examination found both of these influences at play at the same time. For instance, the heart of Book 3 is a discussion of how distress, the worst of all disorders of the soul, can be alleviated. Insofar as the composition of the passage goes, Cicero's dedication to capturing philosophical views eloquently persists throughout the passage. Indeed, before Cicero begins his philosophical critique, he states that this view we have stated in our usual style, the Epicureans state it in theirs, but let us look at their meaning. Their style let us ignore. Loeb editor J.E. King describes the Epicurean style as uncultivated, which illustrates how Cicero was here setting apart his own rhetoric, which was nothing if not well cultivated, as preferable. The Epicurean view referred to is that distress is present to all who dwell on evils. Therefore, a wise or reasonable person will avoid contemplation of evil and instead think of pleasure. Cicero approved of this view about as much as he approved of its rhetoric. Instead, Cicero endorses the Serenaic view that distress is a result of evil which is unexpected. With this perspective, distress can be alleviated either before or after the evil presents itself. On the one hand, distress can be healed by time, as, quote, experience teaches the lesson which reason should have taught before, that the things once magnified are smaller than they seemed. On the other hand, quote, the effect upon wise men of previous consideration is pretty much the same as the effect of the lapse of time upon others. In other words, the wise man anticipates evils, thus alleviating distress before it can come unexpectedly. And this, to Cicero, is the best way to heal the soul of distress. Unfortunately, previous consideration can only be effective before the arrival of the source of distress. But Cicero was shocked and taken aback by Tullia's death, so it took time to recover from his distress. By the time of writing the disputations, time had healed Cicero some, I'm sure, but the letters make it clear that he hadn't healed completely. While Cicero does not directly speak of himself as in distress during the fictitious discussion, he does acknowledge his own situation as one that would cause extreme distress. He mentions that observation of the distress of others including people living in poverty and, quote, those who have lost their children, puts one's own distress in perspective, lessening its effect. So Cicero refers to his own situation as something which others can point to and say, it could be worse. I could be that guy. And this leaves open the question Cicero may have liked to have answered. How can his own distress be relieved other than through the passage of time. So although subtle in the passage, Cicero's philosophy, oratory, and personal circumstance all factor into the composition of this discussion in Book 3. The multiplicity of Cicero's writing can also be seen much more succinctly in other passages. For instance, at the beginning of the dialogue of Book 5, Cicero's interlocutor, called A again, speaks thusly, it does not appear to me that virtue can be sufficient for leading a happy life. If you are going to do any good, you must look out for some fresh arguments. Those you have given have no effect on you. A compares the referenced previous arguments to light wines, which are satisfying to taste, but not to swallow. A similar interaction is found in book one, wherein A asserts that he has read Plato's Phaedo and was convinced while reading, but once he stopped reading, he accrued doubt. In both cases, the interlocutor allows for an 
airtight philosophical case, should that exist, which yet remains unconvincing to the human conscience. He says that virtue does not seem sufficient to live happily when he looks around. The interlocutor finds it difficult to have faith. And not only is he voting, voicing a potential doubt, but he's voicing Cicero's doubt. In the preface, shortly before this discussion, Cicero states that, quote, When I consider with myself the hazards in which fortune has tried me so severely, there are moments when I begin to lose confidence in this opinion of yours and feel exceeding fear of the weakness and frailty of mankind. So while Cicero's character in the disputation is that of the magister, of the teacher, in many ways he's still an unsure student in the face of circumstance. But Cicero's personal doubt would not have been the only motivation to include a passage addressing the ineffectiveness of typical philosophical arguments. Cicero was a man who'd spent his prime trying to be convincing, not only through evidence and sound logic, but through sounding convincing, through oratory and rhetoric. We discussed his conviction that philosophy should be rhetorically sound, and this passage is no exception. So, in one very brief passage, Cicero shows himself to be a grieving father who needs to be convinced not merely logically bested as regards whether virtue is sufficient for a happy life, and he shows the need for both philosophy and rhetoric blended in order to properly address the issue. So a complete multifaceted Cicero shows his face all at once. This passage is a miniature concentrated representation of what the entire Tusculan Disputations amounts to. In the same ways, Cicero crafted both the discussion of distress in Book 3 and the smaller passage in Book 5 complexly, he crafted the whole of the Tusculan Disputations. While what has been discussed here by me and elsewhere by many brilliant scholars has not captured the full complexity of who Cicero was as a person, you can see how the entirety of a complicated talented man in a disorienting time of life was memorialized on the pages wherein his work was composed. And the interaction between his oratory, philosophy, and life experience influenced his writing profusely. Thank you all for tuning in once again. I would like to especially thank Dr. Wynne for guiding me through the research process at the beginning of the semester, I had very little idea what this project would turn into, but Dr. Wynn really helped me bring out the sorts of things I was interested in about the project and how to turn that into something coherent and interesting for me to continue to read about and write about. He and I also spent a fair amount of time translating passages from the disputations, and Cicero's Latin is so complicated and I needed so much help. So, gracias ago magister. I'd also like to thank Dr. Jensen and Dr. Kugler and other professors that I bounced ideas off of. Um, their input was really interesting. They got me thinking about various things and it really impacted the final product. So thank you so much for your time and your investment. I'd also like to thank my roommates and my family for being around being willing to listen to me talk about Cicero, even if my thoughts were all muddled at the time, they were still really helpful and supportive. And my friend Olivia actually taught me the difference between a rhetorician and a rhetor, which was something I didn't know there was a difference between. And she also kind of gave me an insight into the perspective of a rhetorician, or a writer is really what she is, but Rhetoric was probably the thing about Cicero that I personally can relate to the least, so having her around was so helpful. And also, my brother John read my first really rough draft of the essay and gave some very helpful feedback to make it sound better, to get me thinking about a few different things. So, basically, thank you to all who have spoken to me about this project at any point, because it's something that I needed a lot of help 
to bring to fruition. So thank you and stay safe, everyone.